Hello everyone, it's Benny, and welcome back to the 3D game programming tutorial series. Last time, we got our render pipeline pretty much set up and going. It, it does the job. If you wanted to, you could stop here and make your game with the render pipeline pretty much as it is. It does what we needed to. But here's the thing. We saw it has a couple of limitations. Namely, right now, there, it's limited by number of draw calls, because it still issues one draw call for everything you draw. It's not ideal. Today, we're going to explore one of the key advantages of doing things through a game render context. We can do some clever trickery to send optimized instructions to the GPU. We don't have to depend on one draw call per drawing, we can draw things however we like from the game's perspective and still send an efficient rendering command to the GPU. That is what we're going to show in this video, and as you'll see, it's not that horrible. So let's go ahead, let's get into it. So here we are, inside the game render context. How do we draw more than one mesh with a single draw call? Because if you think about it, if there isn't a way to do that, then we can't do any better. I mean, if you're limited to one mesh per draw call, obviously you can't do better than one mesh per draw call. But if there's some way to draw multiple meshes with a single draw call, all of a sudden we're doing great. There is a way to do it. And there is a way to do it. If you see in our draw command, we have this last parameter, which is number of instances. We can specify as many different transform matrices as we want and draw as many instances of that mesh as we want, and that's it. So as long as the only thing different between them is the transform, we can draw more than one. Now, strictly speaking, that isn't a true limitation. Later on, we can get kind of clever about this. We can do things like, okay, if they have anything except for transform and texture, so both of those can vary, and they can still be done in the same instance draw call. That is possible in more advanced systems, doing some more clever trickery. We are not going to do that right now. That's outside of what we want to do. So instead, we're just going to instance based on this. So what's our logic here? If the mesh has both the same vertex array and the same texture, then it's a candidate for being coalesced into a single draw call. I mean, as long as the meshes have the same vertex array and texture, those are the only parameters that aren't the transform, so if they have both of these, great, we could instance the draw call. That's how what we're going to do. What data structure can do that? The big thing here is we need some map. We need a map of things with the same vertex array and textures to a list of transforms. That's what we ultimately want, right? If they have the same vertex array and texture, they're part of the same draw call, we just need the list of transforms to draw them with. So we're going to map a pair of vertex array pointers and texture pointers to a array of matrix. And that is it. This is going to be our mesh render queue. It's not really a queue, that's a little bit misnamer. Maybe I'll call it mesh render buff. Sure. So what we'll do is in render mesh, we will add the mesh to this render buffer. In fact, I'm going to temporarily comment this out and show you how this is done. What we're going to do is we're going to create our pair of vertex array and texture. And actually, yeah, I can just do this more directly. I can do mesh render buffer. The index is going to be a pair. Actually, I'll just use make pair. Why not? A pair of vertex array and texture, specifically the address of vertex array and texture, because we're doing this by pointer. So take those in. That's our index. We have a map. Cool. This. So what we do is we'll look up the map for this pair. If it has the same, whatever has that same pair, we're just going to add another matrix to it. We're going to push back our transform in. There you go. That's it. And once we have that, actually, excuse me, 
we want to push back perspective times transform in. Excuse me. This way we don't have to deal with any perspective shenanigans later on. So yeah, just push back perspective times transform in. There you go. This will create a list of all the same transforms at this particular index. There we go. So, at this point, you might have noticed a little bit of a problem. Hey Benny, if render mesh just adds this to this buffer and nothing else, when does everything add to this buffer actually get rendered? And that is an excellent question. So what we're going to do is we're going to add another method to our game render context, the flush command. This will flush our render buffer and draw everything, issue all our draw commands. And this is really what we want. So we're essentially going to move the logic we used to have into the flush command, where we're going through the render buffer and just rendering everything as efficiently as we reasonably can. So, first thing we need to do, we need to iterate over this giant nonsense. So unfortunately, that means we'll have to copy and paste this type to get an iterator for it. And what we want to do is we want the iterator that's going to equal mesh render buffer dot begin. And we're going to wait till the iterator is at the mesh render buffer dot end. And we're going to increment the iterator. So there we go. There is that ridiculous verbose nonsense. But thankfully, this ridiculous verbose nonsense will allow everything to work pretty efficiently. So what we need to issue the render, just like before, we need our vertex array, texture, and transform. So vertex array pointer, that's going to be our vertex array. We're going to have a texture pointer for our texture. We're going to have a matrix pointer for our transforms. And sure, I'll just have a size t for num transforms. There we go. How do we initialize these? That is going to be tricky. So we want the iterator. We want the... F Whoops, excuse me. I just flew down the screen for some reason. So. In our iterator, we want the first part. That gives us the first half of our thing. That gives us the key. So this will give us a pair. Then we want the first of that pair to get the vertex array. I know. It's kind of silly. But actually, this is not arrow notation, I don't think. So I think, yeah, these are not pointers. So it.first, it.first, dot first. I think think that should be correct. We will find out when it crashes. So we need that. For our texture, we still need the key part, but we need the second because, yeah, it is the texture. For our transforms, we need the second. Specifically, we need element zero of the second, and we want to take the address of that because that will give us, well, the pointer to the matrix list. And for this, we want it.second.size. And yeah, this should be pretty much everything. We should now have all of our key variables in place. Okay, I'm back. I had to check because it was bothering me. And yes, we do need arrow notation for the first because iterators act like pointers. And other than that, we are correct to use just the dot. So this should be the correct configuration. No worrying about it. So there, first thing we want to do before anything else is we want to check how many transforms we have. If number of transforms equals zero, then don't worry about it. Just continue. If you can spell continue correctly, there you go. <laughs> Next thing we want to do, we're going to want to do our texture check. We want to make sure we have the correct texture bound. And this is going to be pretty much what we did before. And in fact, since now this is the only case where current texture is needed, we can move this here. We can say current texture equals null pointer and use it like this. We don't need it as a class variable anymore. <clears throat> and there we go. So once we have all that, we can go to a vertex array. We're going to update the buffer with the transforms. And we're going to take num transforms times size of matrix. So this will put all 
of our transforms into the vertex array, which is perfect. That's exactly what we want. And then we can issue a draw call. And this time we'll pass in num transforms as the number of things we're drawing, because that's how many instances we're drawing. So just to recap, what we're doing, we're going through our render queue. For every pair of vertex arrays and textures that appeared, we will set those up. We will pass in the total number of matrices, matrices that went along with that pair, and we're issuing the draw call for all those matrices at once. That's all we're doing. Hopefully that makes sense. It's not that much, but it's a little bit difficult to say verbally. If that makes sense? So yeah, there we go. That should be all we need, except we do need to call the flush command somewhere. So logically enough, it should make sense. We want to call this after our, well, after we update the system. So after we've done all the rendering, the rendering pipeline has finished executing, we are going to flush. And there we go. We should be done at that point. So let's see what happens off the bat. Make and run. And we have an error, of course. So, what is going on? Ah, I see. This is no longer needs to be address of texture because texture is already a pointer. So we can just compare them directly. That's the first error. What is the next error? Update buffers. Vertex array is a pointer here, so that needs to be like this. And this will also need to be dereferenced to be passed in there. And what else? And current texture does not have any... Ah, we no longer need to initialize it because it's no longer a class variable. And what else? In shader, that's set sampler, we need to dereference the texture because now it's a pointer. So dereference texture to pass it to shader. And I think that should be everything. And hey, things are a little bit weird going on here. And that's because we forgot to clear. <laughs> yeah, we're adding things to the render buffer. We are not clearing the render buffer. But that's actually a pretty easy fix. All we have to do is it.second. That would be e the array of matrices. And just clear it. Every frame. We could clear the entire render buffer if we wanted. That could work too. I'm doing it like this because chances are we're going to have the same mesh pairs every time. So yeah. And now you notice, hey, everything appears to be working. So that's good. But here's the real question. How does it perform? So I have went into my graphics card driver and I've disabled vertical sync. And I have set should render to true. That is how I disable the frame limit and get the accurate frame times here in case anyone was wondering. So now we can actually measure performance. Last time, 5,000, just barely chugging along. Didn't even hit 60 frames per second. Now, look at that. Look at that. Not even one millisecond for 500 meshes. Granted, this is not an apples to apples comparison because last time I actually forgot to build in release mode. Uh, oops. <laughs> so, Unfortunately, we can't get a direct comparison, but the point still stands. Now we can render a stupid amount of meshes. Look at this. 100,000. Let's try 100,000. Can we render 100,000 at real-time frame rates? Wait. That's 10,000. Whoops. <laughs> Excuse me. 100,000. Can we render 100,000? Look at that. It's basically just a solid cube of overlapping mesh geometry. And we're still well under 60 frames a second. We have plenty of room left over to do the rest of the game. It's, it's amazing. It's exactly what we want. So this is the power of taking proper advantage of a game render context. You can optimize what your game is trying to do for what your graphics card can actually do and you can get some mind-blowing performance without really needing to do anything at all in your game code itself. Your game code doesn't have to care. It can just say, oh, I want to draw all this. And the game render context optimizes everything for the graphics card. Everything goes stupid fast. It is awesome. And with that, 
that's pretty much all we need for the rendering pipeline. We, it does the basics of what we want and is set up in a way we can easily add on to it to optimize it, add more features, or just generally expand it as deep as we want to go. And that is the important thing here. Yes, our rendering pipeline is pretty basic, but that's okay because for our first 3D game, we're probably not going to need to go all out on crazy rendering effects. We just need something basic that works, right? We have that, and importantly, we have it in a way that can expand as deep as we want to go if we want to later on. So we can cover advanced rendering later on down the road, but for now, we can move on and get going with the actual game itself, which is awesome. We aren't held up on rendering, we can just go. So that concludes the rendering pipeline. But everything's really static right now. If I run, yeah, my character can move, everything else is stationary. How can we get some motion in the world? How can we do something like, say, I don't know, motion integration? One of the core mechanics we talked about earlier. So how can we do it? And will Benny go on a crazy, ridiculous rant about the sheer stupidity of how people have done this over the years? Find out next time! I hope you enjoyed, I hope you learned, and I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for joining me. If you want to talk more with me or other like-minded people, please join the Benny Discord. It is an awesome place. Everyone is welcome. If you want to support these videos, or you would just like to find out right now, consider becoming a patron on Patreon, because you can get early access to videos and special thanks. Speaking of which, special thank you to my patrons and a very special thank you to those listed in the video description for making these videos possible. Thank you very much to everyone. You guys are the greatest. And I will see all of you in the next video. Till then.